people perish. That helps you understand that passage better. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, open it to the first to 1 Peter chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible with you this morning, there's some in the back. And maybe you have your Bible app ready on your little electronic device. It's a new age. And there's a password that the usher might give you. They might not if they don't know it, but a lot of you have that already. It's the same as we had before. 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll begin at verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, you are the chosen people of royal priesthood. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness in His marvelous yeah. and wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So a spiritual house is made of people, not of bricks and mortar or wood, built out of Christians. Christians who are dead to sin but alive to God and in love with Jesus. Let's pray. God, you are building us from the inside out. Lord, your body is a house not a temple, not a building, but a living, breathing thing that goes out into the world, whose witness cannot be denied or missed. Because inside of each of us, we place a hope that cannot be ignored. And so infuse us with that hope today that we may be contagious we will see and ask us about this Jesus we serve. In your name. Amen. So Craig Greshel in the clip you saw said this right at the end. God says you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. And he asks, are you seeking God? Because great relationships never happen by accident. And what he said is true. When you seek God, you'll find that God has been seeking you. You will find the seeker who's been looking for you with a lot more passion and for a lot longer time than maybe you've been looking for him. In other words, it's not all up to you. You'll find the finder who's looking for you. So God made a decision a long time ago to court humanity or to go after you, to sort of date you, if you will get you. With the passion of a lover, God comes after you and stops at nothing and will stop at nothing to initiate or pursue or continue a relationship with you to build his spiritual house. He needs another brick for that house. Are you ready to be built? A lot of you have heard of William Wilberforce. He was the champion of slavery in Great Britain. He had three sons. His third son was named Samuel. He was turned out to be a, a church professional, featured that, a bishop in England. 
He said Christianity can be reduced to four simple words. And this is where you write those on that thing that says notes if you're taking notes, right? And then if you're in confirmation class coming up, you know this would be a good practice to get started. These four words. Maybe if you're not in confirmation, if you like to write stuff, this is a good thing to do. Admit, submit, commit, or commit, and transmit. Got them? Sounds like an old black preacher, but it's an old English guy. Admit, to admit, to submit, to commit, and then transmit. Okay? Now, if you've been around this summer, you've been studying with us spiritual warfare, right? We've talked about it, how we're in this battle constantly, and that's been a good thing. And we could continue to do that, and we might somewhat, but I think if we did that kind of on end for week after week, we would run a risk that we just have to keep coming back and hearing how you need to fight valiantly because we're in this battle and we're trying to win, but we never do. That would be the risk, is we never feel victorious like champions. That's what we are. We did win. We have won. There's another risk. And I think that's a greater one. And this is probably more true of you if you've been around the church at all the last 10 or 15 years, at least for me, this is true. We never talked about spiritual warfare or stopped talking about it. I don't know, in the 60s or the 70s. We never thought about being in this otherworldly contest between good and evil, God and Satan. And that's a higher risk, a greater risk. Because then it's sort of like, well, is there a fight at all if we never talk about it? Because I feel like it sometimes. I do feel like I'm losing. And then we just sort of do our best to get along until Jesus comes. But see, that, that isn't enough for me. There's more to it than that. The first risk stems from the fact that forgetting that Jesus already won, right, the battle on the cross, tempts us to think that we don't have to do anything. The second one, that we never talk about warfare, sort of tempts us to think, well, do we have to help God finish this battle? Did, did God really win? Did Jesus complete what he was going to complete? Because the world's pretty messed up. Those are two ditches that we want to stay out of, right? So this sermon in 2 Peter, 1 Peter this morning, addresses that. It kind of cuts through the middle. It doesn't really take up that argument. He says, what about Christian hope? And that's what we'll talk about today. Because if we think we have to help God even a little bit, it's a rejection of grace, ultimately, right? Because life is really pretty good for most of us. We don't suffer too much. So we think, well, God must just love us a whole lot. Or we imagine that we're so adorable, no wonder God loves us. That's a risk as well. That also sort of pushes grace aside, saying, I really don't need it because, boy, look, I'm good here. Those are ditches we want to avoid. To rely only on the grace of God, though, with no change in character, right? No abundant life, no lasting joy or unsinkable hope is to live as if we don't need the, the mercy of God. So grace and mercy are these two concepts that sort of weave their way through these letters. And we'll look at one of them in First Peter. And those arguments will continue. Grace, mercy, goodness, not goodness, doing good, trying to earn your way in. Well, it's all for free, so you don't have to do anything. All those sort of keep weaving, and they still do today. But Jesus comes to say, I'm going to give it to you. And I dare you to try to live as you're used to once you really get it. Okay? God's mercy is that character of God that suspends judgment. The, the, the judgment that we deserve because we're on the wrong side of God. That's called sin. He takes it himself. And makes us right with the Father because of what Jesus did and does. That's mercy. When you see mercy in the Bible, it's a term kind of related to sickness or affliction. So we have this illness, this terminal condition. And someone who had mercy on somebody else was somebody who had sympathy for somebody who was sick or needed treatment or healing, who caught something. So God's mercy then is compassion for us because he sees our sickness, our illness, the plague of sin. It's universal. Okay? That malady that all of us have, which leads only 
death. So when Jesus comes to die for us, it makes us dead to sin, which is part of us, even though he didn't sin. He gives us what he has. That's the exchange. Okay? Jesus died because of sin, but it was our sin and not his. Make sense? So since we're already sort of dying, why not die in sin and live for Jesus? That's what the New Testament message said over and over again. Because it was foreign to their ears. The cure for sin is Jesus. Who heals, cleanses, forgives, and gives abundant life and eternal life, even though we don't deserve it. And now we're circled back to grace. So in this sermon in 1 Peter, in your New Testament, he cuts through this debate of doing good for the sake of goodness, which is fine. You can do that. So do the pagans. So do the atheists. Right? Or doing good to hide something because you did a bunch of bad stuff. And you're trying to all maybe go camouflage or cover. You do good. People think you're good. And really, down deep, you're not. Or doing good just to maybe balance the scales a little bit. Turn to uh, chapter 3 of 1 Peter. Because he uses, as I said, a word to cut through the debates. And that word is hope. And it's one of my favorite sections in the New Testament, the whole Bible. 1 Peter 3, verse 13. Because I want you to hear about hope this morning. We've been in the battle. We've talked about spiritual warfare. But we need some hope as well. Verse 13 of 1 Peter 3. Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Right? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ the Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be, may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better for this God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous and the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. You ever think about this, that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead and the only one who was born once but didn't die twice, the first to come back from the dead? Born of Mary, reborn as resurrection, as a resurrected son of God, who didn't die again, but came back. The only one, right? I mean, Lazarus was raised by Jesus, but he died again, or we know about it, right? Enoch was assumed into heaven. Elijah sort of goes off into heaven, but they're not back. So where they are, I be in heaven. Jesus comes back, and that's the difference, okay? If you're here this morning, you've been born once. So raise your hand if you've been born once. Maybe everybody. Okay. Okay. Maybe some of you are raising your hand on the inside. I know. I'm shy. I'm glad to see you in the front row. Oh, that's kind of nice. Somebody should take a picture. If you've been born once, you know this. You're going to die once, right? Christ of life living on earth is the end of life doesn't last forever, this life. If you die to Jesus, though, today, or if you've done that already, and then you're living as though you're dead to the sin that's part of you for the rest of your life, remember the malady, the plague, that stuck to us? You only have to die physically one more time at the end of the life of your body, right? To be born again and live forever. But here's the other side of that. If you've been born once and do not choose to die to yourself, choose to serve yourself, before the life of your body comes to an end, God will honor that decision as well. You will die to God at the end of your earthly life, and that's not an eternal nap, as I think a lot of folks want to believe. It's an eternal separation from God. And an eternal separation from God can be nothing but unspeakable agony. That's the other side, folks. That's why we're here. That's why we gather. That's why we read this book. We 
go out from here with a message the world needs to hear. That's why God is so passionate to have a relationship with you today, to share with you a hope that is unsinkable and undeniable, that others would see it and ask you about it, that they could have it as well. Because the world needs it. Remember the four-word description of the Christian life to admit, to submit, to commit, to transmit? To understand that God has mercy on us, compassion for us, sympathy for our condition. And having seen that pays our debt to Jesus. That is to know the grace of God, to admit who God is and who we are. And that's a good motivation for good behavior, probably the best one. Now, there's other motivations to do good things, and they've done this throughout scriptures. Why do good things? Because they're good. The world needs Christians to do good things. It's more than good advertising. Just don't do good things to save yourself, because you can't. So don't try. Let God save you. So if you take that first one and admit, when you admit you need Jesus to make you right with God and then submit to God and His teachings, you can't help but to inherit a hope that nobody can deny. It's out of this world, literally out of this world. Worth living for and worth dying for. As the church through the centuries can demonstrate, right? A hope that will never disappoint you. Even though there are seasons of life that are not so fun. Even though life isn't always easy. But for that we turn to scripture as well. So turn to the apostle, to what uh, Paul wrote in Romans. Chapter 5, verse 1. Because he knew it wasn't easy. His life was a pretty tough record of what it's like to follow Jesus, to set your compass, to follow him, and then see what comes back your way. A lot for him. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith, I'll be physical there, into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our suffering, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. Suffering, all really, we have to talk about that. Verse 5, and hope does not put us Shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the greatest testimony to the truth found in the Bible has not been the faultless lives of Christians in our day and age or down through the centuries. The best evidence of the truth that Jesus proclaimed has not come from the stellar record of the church. The institutions of Christianity, its structure, its hierarchy, bishops, pastors, the whole thing, right? Hypocrisy and frailty as well. Those aren't good evidences or records of how the truth is the truth. The best evidence, the greatest testimony to the fact that Jesus won the battle, that the body of Christ is winning today the battle, and those who believe in God and love and obey Jesus will win in the end, has been and forever will be this, the undeniable, unshakable, and unsinkable hope that the people of God have clung to, rested on, relied on in the face of failure, disaster, war, famine, right, disease, death, betrayal, violence, accidents, anything or anything that might cause us to question God's power or God's love. In spite of that, the Christians still say, Jesus is Lord. The best evidence for the truth of the hope that Christians have is the lives that they lead in spite of things that happen. Things that happen will happen. Hope instead of in spite of it. The crazy ideas that shouldn't work but do. The remarkable love they show for one another by forgiving each other, serving each other, pouring ourselves out, leading, caring, and waiting. Him to come back. Well, that's a witness to hope. And I've got 20 centuries if you want to fold back and look to see what this word has done on the face of the planet. 
So once you admit who God is, His true nature revealed to you in a relationship with Jesus, and then you trust that God is real and begin to see yourself as God sees you, forgiven, as treasured, as valued, you've already won half the battle. And so we can take you there to the middle of the battle in just a few words today. The other half is to commit your life to good behavior, as the New Testament tells us to do, 1 Peter, so that your new life, your unsinkable hope, is transmitted an unspeakable joy and peace that everybody can see. It's in that verse 15 of chapter 3 of 1 Peter. Maybe you've undermined it. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So here's a challenge. Do people ask? Do they see it in, in you? Because if they're not <clears throat> excuse me, asking, it might be because they don't see it right away. The hope that is, an unsinkable hope, when they look at your life. And if they don't see it immediately, is it possible that they see something else first? Maybe they see worry, or busy, or distracted, or sad, or depressed, or whatever it is that your life sort of emanates because it's taken over and hope is pushed down and set aside. Something is blocking it or pitching it off and it can't get through, but it's there. And maybe if that's you, maybe there's some admitting you need to do to God and to one another. To clear some air. And then some submitting to Him as well as leading His guiding. So that you can come in again. And that new joy that you found, that you've had before, that unsinkable hope, will transmit something that nobody can deny. If that's you this morning, it might be, do a gut check. Do you have unsinkable hope in the face of what's happening in your personal life, in this world, in this community? Because it's real easy to lose focus, right? It's easy to sort of get lost in the power of sin and the sting of death. Do you know what you are saved for? <clears throat> that you're called to conduct yourselves, ourselves with good behavior that Jesus Christ calls us to do. Because if hope is not the first thing others see when they look at you because you're a professing Christian, there's a cure. It's simple and powerful, but not always easy. But if you do it, I guarantee you, you'll soon be one of these contagious witnesses who people will see running around the community or in your family or at work or wherever you go, who's way too happy. And it's annoying. It really is. But there's something inside you that they see. And then they're going to ask, well, what is it that gives you hope? How come you're so bubbly all the time? You can't be that happy. You must be happy on something, right? Well, they're not often. They're on Jesus, okay? It's not a secret. It's not a drug. A lot of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are those folks, and you're annoyingly happy, and I'm glad you are. Because some of us aren't always happy or annoyingly happy. But you've got a hope and a joy down deep that people can see. Because you're right with God. Now, to you who believe this stone is precious, Peter said in the sermon, that priceless stone yours. It's no accident, I think, that God has gathered this community, this body, as if you will, this, this morning, or over the last couple of years as we've sort of moved our way to this place. It's kind of remarkable, and we take no credit for it. Some of you have worked very hard, that's good, but it's all to God, right? God designed it, God's brooding over it, and God has a plan for our gatherings. He doesn't roll the dice and sort of hope it'll come out good, right? Or spin the wheel and then sit there and wish that it'll land in the right spot, right? God doesn't do that. He does things on purpose and for a purpose, and He does that for you. To build you into a spiritual house. One of 
one of the ways I like to hear what God is saying in the Bible is to read a different translation. Some of you read the, the Message translation, Eugene Peterson. He's a pastor for about 40 years. He sat down one day and he said, you know, if, if I had to write the Bible or translate it, or sort of convey it to folks on the street, language people use every day, what would it sound like? And he took a few years to do that. But listen, if you will, as we close this morning to these words from 1 Peter, from his translation, it's a paraphrase, and see if they strike you in a new way. In fact, if you'd like, if you dare, you can close your eyes and listen. I won't tell. Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out, but God set it in the place of honor. Present yourselves then as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life, in which you'll serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. Because you are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of His work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do His work and speak out for Him, to tell others of the night and day difference He made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Remember, the spiritual house is made of people, not bricks. And it's built of Christians, dead to sin, alive to God, and in love with Jesus. Amen? Amen.